So first, uh, thank you for your practice. Um, you can really feel it, feel it here in Baja. It's very obvious. It's in the air everywhere here, um, your practice. And um, want to encourage you to um, stay with it, to keep on going. And I'll talk a little bit too. Um, I, I saw this thing, a uh, tricycle uh, sent out. I hope it's here, still here. Yeah, it is. Um, three. Oh, yeah, thank goodness I can lose that. Three, um, well, two uh, essays on practicing with relationship. And it caught my eye because I think I've always thought that Zen practice was a solitary sport, which is really weird because it's not, it's obviously not, but somehow in my mind, good Zen practice is um, sitting by yourself and, and seeing that this very moment as it is, even without all the things we want, uh, even if we don't have all the things we want, our life is perfect, whole, complete. There's great joy in every moment of life, uh, even when we don't get what we want, which is always, of course, uh, there's always, something that could be a little better, like the internet could be working a little better. Um, and it's true that the traditionally um, Zen practice, it depends on what tradition you're talking about, but maybe talking about in Dogen, Zenji's time in Japan, uh, and even to some degree now, the uh, the practice, the strong sitting practice, session practice, uh, was really for people who were single, um, celibate, uh, and and I just kind of had that image of sitting alone somewhere. Um, but in fact, one of the three treasures is the Sangha. So three treasures, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Buddha is awakening to that fact that as it is, this moment is perfect. With all my trouble, uh, it is perfect. Um, Dharma is the teachings of the Buddha. And then Sangha is the people. And the sangha could be seen on so many different levels, but um, could be the people and the animals, or the people and the animals and the plants, uh, or sometimes people who practice. But at any rate, one of the three treasures is about relationship. It's about practicing together and being in relationship. And yet, I, I don't know how often we particularly look at that. Um, if, if you recall, I, I like the, the first part of the Three Pillars of Zen, uh, Yastani Roshi's uh, instructions for how to do Zen. He particularly wrote for Westerners, 
Um, and it's, it's very handy, it's not very long, but it has everything in there, Kenyan and sitting and also five different reasons to practice. Um, it's, it's very clear to me that uh, each of us has a unique practice path. And that reminds me, I think it was Aiken Roshi was at ZCLA. Pretty sure it was Aiken Roshi. And, and he was saying some people, he said, as I recall, as I remember what he said, he said, uh, some people say each of us is on a different path to enlightenment. So kind of the picture of like a mountain and there's all the different ways up the mountain to the enlightenment at the top of the mountain. Uh, and he said, uh, how he sees it, uh, or, or, or you could say there's a forest, and uh, you walk through that forest to become enlightened. And he said, as he sees it, um, there's just the forest. There's no path for anybody. Uh, and in terms of a place that's enlightened too, there's only the forest. Uh, but at any rate, all of us are You know, and I, I'll use that term path, uh, even though, uh, as we all know, there is no path. Every once in a while, we feel like we're lost. We've lost the path, but we haven't. Whatever we're doing is it. Um, but anyway, the point being, whatever reasons you have for deciding to do Zen practice, uh, it's going to be different for each of us, I think. And when we share stories, we find out we have different reasons, different expectations. Um, the five that Gastani uh, Roshi lays out is, and he puts them in order, but I don't think there's a particular order. Um, one being physical and mental well-being, which nowadays meditation is recommended for just about anything. Um, the power of meditation for health and well-being is tremendous. And many of us, that's what brings us to practice, a health issue or uh, emotional issues or something like that. that that we want to make better, so we practice. Uh, and then the second was the outside way, which is uh, like Father Kennedy is, is a, a serious Zen practitioner, wonderful Zen master, and he's a Catholic priest. He, he uh, is not a Buddhist. And so there are many people in other spiritual disciplines who do Zen um, to realize that that way, outside way. I don't know. The language is so difficult. And then there's just to get enlightened. I just want to get enlightened. I just want to see what Buddha saw. Uh, That's pretty much why I practice, I think. I just want to have that same experience. Uh, and then there's the bodhisattva practice, which is, um, which includes, I want my life to uh, reflect true self. Uh, I, I want to live an enlightened life and uh, and I want to serve others. I, I want to share the practice with others or serve others in whatever way I can. Um, and then there's the shikantasa, which is just this, no reason. Just 
right here, being with all of you. That's why I practice. Um, but it doesn't mention relationship. I want to practice for the sake of relationship. It's very interesting. So anyway, what I wanted to read you is uh, Norm Fisher. There are two people did articles. Um, Norm Fisher, he doesn't call himself Roshi, he looks like. He calls himself Priest Norm Fisher. Uh, anyway, wonderful Zen master in the San Francisco lineage. Um, and he says, We're not anyone in particular. Every moment in response to the conditions in front of us, another person, the sky, the flowers, we are created again. That's who we are, our relationship in this moment. Of course, conventionally, we have identities, commitments, love, hates, and preferences. But that's not, not all of who we are. That's the point of Zen practice. And I think of all spiritual practice to get in touch with the person that we are beyond the person we seem to be. We don't really ever come to that understanding and realization by ourselves. In Zen practice, it is understood that we enact this wisdom in our connection to one another. It's our dharma relations renewed moment by moment as we meet each thing and each person that brings us to the truth and a kind of awakening within and beyond our suffering. When you think about Zen stories, this is how they work. They are not talks given by wise teachers. They're encounters between people. Every Zen story is a story of a meeting. It's a story of a relationship. And as we see from these stories, not necessarily conventional notion of relationship in which we're fulfilling each other's needs, but a more profound sense of our connection to one another. So, In the, in the koans, um, it's true. Although there are some koans that it's just one person. When Buddha was born, of course, his mom was there when he was born. But he said, above the heavens, below the earth, I alone, the world honored one which doesn't mean I'm better than everybody. It means my true nature is everything. Each of us can say that. I alone, above the heavens, below the earth, and the world honored one. Uh, like Norm says in this, in this talk, um, what we are is Indra's net, the, that connection of everything which is scientifically accurate also. All the atoms are connected with energy. Um, so, and, and then that connection is constantly changing and constantly moving. So what my very nature is, is relationship to everything. Um, and that's what Buddha meant. That's what I think he meant when he said that precocious baby that he was talking the minute he was born. Um, and there's some others. Um, there's a few others. Master, are you in? Every day, he would say, Master, yes. Are you in? Yes. Don't be deceived by others. Don't be deceived that there's anything separate from this. And of course, we're deceived that way constantly. We're judging that some 
And if you just want to keep it to people, some people are good, some people are bad. Uh, there's people I'm way better than, there's people I'm way worse than. Uh, every interaction has our comments and judgment and separation. Um, but other than that, I can't, I don't know if there's any other poems uh, where there's just one person in the poem. Most of them, many are two, many are about the relationship of teacher and student. Um, and that's why for Zen, uh, working with a teacher is so important. Um, and and it's it's kind of difficult for Westerners, I, I think. Uh, that kind of relationship is certainly not as honored as it is anyway in Buddhist traditions. But um, the, the transmission of the Dharma comes through the teacher-student relationship. And of course, there's nothing to transmit, it's just this. But the way it's developed is through that relationship. There's a koan about the chicken and the egg. Um, the, the chick inside the egg and the way the chick gets born is the hen pecks from the outside and the chicken pecks from the inside. And I always like to think of that shell as our stuff. So sure, teachers have needs and neuroses and um, interesting karmas, just as students have all of those. So we work on those together. The two realize that connection, the connection we all have that is who we are. And the best way to work on that is with someone else. Uh, so same goes for the Sangha, the pe your Dharma brothers and sisters, the people you practice with. Uh, that, that thing we talk about all the time, which uh, it's a Christian reference. I forgot the name of the priest. Um, but I think he's the first one that talked about living in community. Uh, a nun wrote him asking, because, uh, you know, in those days when nuns had questions, they asked the guys. But anyway, the nun asked, how do we, how do we have harmony in our community? Uh, and he said, well, community is so important to practice. It's like, um, one of those machines that polishes rocks, which all they are is like a handle that tosses the rocks around and the rocks bump up against each other until they're polished. So practicing together, we polish each other's practice. Um, but you could certainly say that about any group of people, a family or, I have, a bunch of people I camp with, uh, our neighbors, the neighbors. Uh, we have the opportunity to practice together with anyone we need and practicing to realize that connection, uh, to experience that connection. Uh, and how to do that is letting go of our ideas and concepts, letting go of that those boundaries. Uh, I just saw California just passed the thing to, um, you can't discriminate according to caste anymore. I thought they decided that a long time ago, but uh, all the ways that we discriminate against each other. Um, and so, so anyway, where, where, where I'm taking this um, is sometimes we think, or I think, it's better 
to be single. It's better not to have a family. It's better to practice in a monastic setting. Um, and uh, let me read you what this, this other, um, the other piece that was in tricycle. This is Anam Tubten. I'm not the pronunciation, forgive me. Tubten, I don't know, but he's a Tibetan teacher. And uh, this is uh, in Tibet, a respected practitioner of Chode was once asked if he had ever done a journey into the haunted ground of the cemetery. He said, no, I haven't gone. I don't need to go because I'm married. So in other words, I don't need to go into haunted, scary places because I get enough of that being married. Uh, and uh, this teacher goes on to say, within the haunted ground of relationships, many old neurotic patterns get triggered. We develop habits of dumping emotional baggage on our partners, triggering reactions that ricochet back on us when we are blind to our own demons of jealousy, complaint, paranoia, and dis dissatisfaction. These unresolved shadowy patterns are easily projected on the other, but they are the demons of our own unfinished issues. And he talks about, he talks about specifically, I can send this article to anyone who wants it. He, he talks about, goes into detail about the difficulties that we experience in, um, well, in this case, in, in domestic relationship, in, in uh, uh, having a sexual partner. But I think you could say it about any relationship that uh, at some point in any relationship, there's the honeymoon period. There's the time when you just feel like you found a soulmate. You found someone who really gets you and uh, makes life so much easier and takes care of you. And now life is going to be good from now on. Uh, and then uh, I think Elder Bob said once the honeymoon period lasts from one month to two years is what he said. <laughs> but then at some point uh, we start triggering each other and that's where it's like that chicken and egg, that shell starts to come out and we start getting irritated about things or we see places our values don't meet or whatever. Um, and his point, I mean, I've kind of always been, uh, been of the philosophy that if it's not working, leave. <laughs> I thought that, and nowadays they talk about that a lot. You know, if, if it's toxic, you should leave. And, and certainly, I, I, you know, you, you can't say how each relationship is going to evolve. And certainly, if it's toxic, you should leave. If it's abusive, you should leave. Uh, if you've done everything you can to work on it, you should leave. Um, but I'm more of the kind of like, okay, one, one failure, I'm gone. Um, and I was surprised. That he's like, that's that's the good part of the relationship. Now, now you're in the place where you're working together and you can use the relationship to work on yourself. Uh, to the the barriers that we have to waking up is our sense of self. And he talks about you know, he lists jealousy and things like that, but we say greed, anger, ignorance. 
the way we separate from each other is through greed, anger, ignorance. So when I'm not getting what I want, when you're upsetting me all the time, and when I forget that there's no self, that we are one, uh, then those are points of practice. Uh, and that's why both of these teachers are saying relationships are good for our practice. So to, to run away from relationship because a good Zen practitioner doesn't, isn't attached. Okay, that word, attachment. Um, whatever that means, uh, that's something we're supposed to let go of when our greed, when uh, when we harm ourselves and others through our greed, and that greed separates us from true self. Um, but on the other hand, love is an aspect of true self. It's somebody. Sambhadra, I'm not going to be able to say it. <laughs> Samanta Bhadra, there <laughs> is the uh, goddess of, of love. And I think love is different from compassion, right? Compassion, there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a power imbalance, right? I don't know. But I just thought of this compassion is kind of like, I care about you. I really feel your pain. I'm so sorry. I want to help you. Uh, and love is just love. It's just total connection. And no sense of, it's not transactional. It's not, um, uh, as a good bodhisattva, I have to help you. Uh, it's really a deep aspect of true self is love. And in this net, what's hooking it all together could be love. So to practice experiencing that with each other, and admittedly, it's very difficult sometimes. Sometimes it's too easy, and many times it's so difficult. Um, but as practice. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful way to look at how Sangha practices together um, and a wonderful way to look at just how we live in the world. I, I'm kind of getting to experience that now living in it's kind of a retirement com community, but yeah, it's a community of people who love Mexico and uh, very different very different ideas about everything around here. Uh, and yet, just practicing, seeing each other in the middle, from, from my standpoint, to see everyone as Buddha and to appreciate um, everyone and, and then work on my stuff when something irritates me so much. The biggest thing we fight about around here is how dogs should be. <laughs> and I get so self-righteous about my opinion. Uh, so let me read what, what this um, Ben teacher says about, about this thing. Transcending self is a grand concept. The question is how we can experience this in an authentic way. People can experience this by raising children or taking care of elderly parents or friends, giving up sleep and vacations, giving up money and happiness, and forgoing their own needs is a path to spiritual growth. Fulfilling the true commitment of a relationship is extraordinary, unrelenting, selfless activity. It is one of the most authentic ways that humanity can experience self-transcendence. This is authentic selflessness, not the endorphin-intoxicated spiritual trance 
that some mistakenly think of as a transcendent experience. Interesting. Anyway, it's just interesting to me. And um, like I said, having an idea about the right way to practice. Um, each of us finds our own way and we also have our own reasons. So I think it's important to clarify your vow, clarify what it is you wanna do um, in order to be able to do that. And of course the, the ancients, our elders, give us wonderful examples of practice. Um, but like Maizumi Roshi, the, his, what he always says, it's up to you how it's going to be in the West. Or I think he doesn't have, you don't have to put location on it. It's up to us how Zen practice is going to flourish. Let, let's not say flourish, how Zen practice is going to be of value in our time. Um, and to, to, of course, rely on the great teachings of the past and to realize that some of those monastic models and um, you know, like celibacy made a lot of sense when there wasn't birth control and uh, not having children, which was a reason for celibacy, uh, maybe made more sense uh, in that time than it does now. Um, and living a, a very busy full life rather than retreating and cutting down and completely simplifying everything may, may not be the best upaya or skillful means for this time. Um, and always for me, it comes back to Zazen. I can't imagine Zen without Zazen and without serious Zazen time. Uh, so from my standpoint, that's the biggest thing I want to encourage all of you to, uh, to keep a Zazen practice going. And of course, you're all sitting here, so preach into the choir once again. Uh, I'm so happy to see that. For me, the what we go through during session is something I don't experience in any other place, in any other practice. Uh, it goes so deep to um, releasing those patterns, those ancient, ancient patterns that we've developed in our DNA, in our bodies. Um, so I encourage you to keep on going. And I uh, also encourage you to think of relationship as practice and use relationship. Um, and even now, you're not speaking, session, so you're not speaking, there's still a lot of relationship stuff going on, like the noises people are making or the uh, who didn't do their job right. or uh, So just watching how relationship works is so valuable during session too. That's why it's more powerful to sit together and experience that. It happens. Um, I, I sat with Peter Matheson for years and I admired him, of course, because he's kind of a famous guy, but I never talked to him because he would come right when session started and then he would leave right when it ended. So we never talked, but we sat together many sessions. And when we finally talked, we were like best friends. We just talked and talked and talked. 
So that happens uh, in relationship when you're sitting. Um, so thank you again. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you all the time. When session started, I was glad I wasn't doing the whole thing. And now I'm jealous of those of you who are, because it is uh, the most transformational practice I know, this session. Thank you.